A biker revenge tale isn't a story pitch that attracts my attention, but any kind of story can get a thumbs up if it's well done. This time, Adam and I discuss the first four issues of Mayfield 8, written and illustrated by Tim Larson. Find out if the story caught our fancy, no matter its story pitch, after this. Hey, I'm Jen. And I'm Sean. We're here to tell you about our podcast, Worst Collection Ever. And this is the show where we tell you about the worst comic book collection in existence. And it just happens to belong to us. We have some of the worst comics from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They're bad. They don't, Terrible. They're not worth anything. No good. Why do we Very own them? Bad. I own number of issues of Terror Inc. and Guy Gardner. Basically, we go around to local comic book stores and we buy everything we can out of dollar boxes. We tell you about the weird stuff in them. We tell you about stuff that's related to them. We go into tangents and we're very uninformed. So, Oh my God, totally. But totally check out our podcast because you'll hear us just talk and joke about Marvel books and DC books from God only knows when. That's right. It's our show. Worst collection ever. Every Tuesday on iTunes iTunes, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcasts. Download, rate, subscribe, tell a friend. It'll be good and terrible, but good. This is Tim. And this is Adam. And this is Critiquing Comics. Welcome to Critiquing Comics, uh, two weeks in a row, because this is what we've got. Um, I've got some Deconstructing Comics episodes planned, but Kumar and Emmett were both busy. So (laughs) in the meantime, just cranking out the Critiquing Comics here. Um, So yeah, how was your New Year's? My New Year's was pretty good. I went back to... Uh, I went back to my hometown in San Jose, California, and got to see lots of relatives and uh, just kind of relax, took my two older kids with me. So mm. I had a really nice time. Yeah. Okay. So this was sent to us by Tim Larson, who said that this comic is a biker revenge tale set in the 1970s involving an innocent fry cook who makes one bad decision. Uh, the comic is called Mayfield 8. Tim uh, wrote and drew, well, I guess he co-wrote it. There is another name on there also um but he is the artist i I think he's actually the the writer there was another person who he met on a facebook fan forum for sons of anarchy robert stokes yeah yeah and he wrote some so in like i think issue three and or two and three there's some short fiction at the end and i think that Mm. that is Robert Stokes. And then okay. I think in issue four, there's a, a bit of a bit of his stories got into the comic. Yeah, on the splash page, it says written by Tim Larson and Robert Stokes of is- issue four. Yeah, right. So I, I think issues one through three were mostly written entirely by Tim. Okay. And yeah, so on the face of it, this comic didn't sound like my cup of tea at all. It just <laughs> was not anything that appealed to me, but you know, it's reading for critique and comics. So, all right. Um, and you know, it's, it's a pretty raunchy and adult comic and violent. Uh, and you know, it says for mature readers on it, Yeah. but I just thought it was so well written that it kept me going. He sent us four issues and I read all of them just now before (laughs) recording like in Mm -hmm. 45 minutes or something. Um, yeah. So it it just seemed to be well plotted and, and had, there was research involved and, you know, cause it's taking place in the seventies and he was mindful of things that were happening then. Um, yeah, yeah, and just just the plotting of it was really interesting too. It's kind of complicated. A lot of characters to keep track of. Yeah, yeah, I I totally agree. Uh, the fact that you said that he did a lot of research. There's little things, little off the cuff remarks. I think there's a part where he mentions uh, Patty Hearst and the mm-hmm. SLA coming after them, and I was like. Either he's very keen on history or he was alive in the 70s to, like, remember that. <laughs> because I don't think a lot of people well, are even that's on their radar. Yeah, I found, just searching, I found uh, some inf- info about him on artstation.com. And so he 
he got a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Minneapolis College of Art and Design in 1985. So, yeah, I think he, like me, he pro- probably remembers Patty Hearst from when he was a kid. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was a... Uh, I, I think that probably slipped past a lot of readers, but I, yeah, I, I caught that. And I, I actually wasn't alive in the 70s, but um, I, I was a history major, so I, I guess I remember it that way. But I see. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. So initially when I read just the the message that he sent to us that said, you know, if you like, um, what was it, Easy Rider and Sons of Anarchy. And I watched Sons of Anarchy, at least a couple seasons of it. Um, I think this is much closer to Sons of Anarchy than it is to Easy Rider. <laughs> um, it's a lot more of the violent biker gang stuff and not just like a couple of hippies sneaking weed across the border or cocaine or whatever. But... Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. It is very, it's definitely for mature readers. It reminded me a lot of the old vertigo kind of books that came out in the nineties that were kind of like, you know, like preacher or trans metropolitan or those kind of books that were, were intentionally kind of trying to push the envelope. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's very, very well scripted. It, and I think the art goes along with that. Like you never for a moment doubt that it's in the 1970s, all the cars and the outfits and everything. You can tell that there's kind of a cinematic thing that I think is going on in his head. Like he has this whole world kind of visualized and, and written out very well. So it comes across that way for sure on the page. And just kind of glancing at the four issues that are finished so far, it's supposed to be a six issue series but I I can see improvements in the art. Like if I compare the first issue, which looks fine, but I mean, it's kind of on the order of a lot of the so-so comics that we've discussed on Critiquing Comics over the years, but it it keeps getting better, I think. Um, I it, And maybe he's changed what he's drawing with, I wonder. Because... Um, hmm. The first one, looking at the early pages here, it seems like the line is kind of thicker, and but also I don't know. It's just I feel like the the anatomy is getting better as he goes. Yeah, that's the one. It's the anatomy because he he's obviously very accomplished at drawing certain things like bikes and and um, a lot of those motion and, shots and like uh, you know establishing shots look really great. Mm-hmm. There are some sometimes where the foreshortening doesn't work or where there's some tangents, the way that the shoulders kind of come away from the, from the neck and stuff like that, that are created. But I agree with you in, in issue right away from issue two, and especially into issue three and four, his art is becoming a lot more accomplished. And um, there's a lot, there's very, very few of those moments where I think, Oh, that's kind of a weird angle or that's kind of a weird way the body's doing that. Mm Mm-hmm. And especially issue four has some really, really great, the blocking in some of these shots is really great. Like you have something in the foreground and then another thing in the background and you can see characters interacting in different levels of the, like different planes Mm -hmm, of view. mm -hmm, And I think that the, like I said, the cars look like the cars that kids were driving when, (laughs) when I was a kid, you know, and like most comics artists hate drawing cars, I think, but, um, yeah, these are really good looking cars and, you know, time, time specific cars. Yeah. Yeah. Those police, those police cars especially look great. They look really cool. And (laughs) that whole scene with the, with the car chases and stuff, it must've been a hell to draw, but it looks really good. So, Mm mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, you were saying most people hate to draw cars, but I think the only thing worse than a car is a bike. Like, the, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah, we got those because a, in here, too. Yeah, and like a, you know, a, a motorcycle, like, you have to draw the way the person is sitting on it. In a car, you can cut that all off by showing a door, or you can cheat and have stuff in front of the in front of the driver, but you have to show the whole body how it sits on the bike, mm-hmm. and and the handlebars that come out that look weird when, you know, they don't look natural in real life. So when you're trying to draw that, it's very, very difficult. And I think, um, it's ambitious of him to draw a biker comic, to be honest. Like (laughs) I I get the impression that he liked, you know, reading from some of the stuff that he puts in the afterwards and, and some of the, you know, comments to the readers, 
I get the feeling that he really loved the show Sons of Anarchy and maybe just loved biker, you know, media, biker culture in the first place and then decided to make a comic. I don't know if he necessarily loved drawing bikes to begin with, but um, yeah, hats off to him because he, he did it and he did it well. I think the the bikes all look really good too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, boy, w- when the comic is great, there's less to say. It seems like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, hmm. I I have some things to say. I I totally agreed with you about the artwork, you know, um in the beginning um with the anatomy, but I did think that the color was really really well done and he uses the color to a good effect of like showing um there's a scene where he's talking about his father being hit by a train and it shows the exact same shot but it's one is at night with a fiery wreck and one is the next day when mm. the police are kind of investigating the yeah, scene. And I'm so it's, at it now. yeah, the coloring it's, it, it's mostly the coloring that changes the two scenes mm-hmm. and they look totally different. And, um, and the two panels and it looks, it's really, really cool effect there. Yeah. And even the inset panels are before and after, or like last night and today, the, the close-ups of, uh, kind of aspect to aspect here's a broken motorcycle headlight and here is another car part and yeah right yeah so um yeah i think that he did he does a good job he uses some i I think the coloring is digital but it looks very it doesn't have that weird polished look that a lot of digital coloring has he doesn't use like the the weird little shimmer effect or like the, the gradients that look really fake and stuff he has really natural kind of coloring that looks really good and and tells a lot about mood so Mm -hmm. the fact that he wrote a really solid script and then drew you know like you said progressively the art gets better and better so he drew a you know a pretty accomplished like you know the 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 pen work the line work and stuff and then the fact that he can go in and color that too like really says a lot about his you know skill as a storyteller i think because um it'd be impressive if one person had if he had one of those uh, talents, but the fact that he can do all three is really cool. So, hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean that, hmm. well, I guess it makes sense. I was going to say, so on that art station page, this is something that I guess he set up to advertise himself as an artist for other writers, which sure, go ahead. Um, I feel like he maybe needs to advertise himself as a writer too. <laughs> I mean, usually that's not the way that it works, right? Somebody's got a story idea and they need somebody to illustrate it, not so much the other way around. But um, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, he's an artist, but he's also a very good writer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, it's interesting because I think there's a lot of people like that. I would count myself among them who probably got into comics because I was into making art and then later realized that the storytelling was more of what I was interested in. Maybe he's the same way that he, you know, if he went to an art school, you said he went to the Minneapolis school of art and design or something like that. Yeah. Then he probably, um, MCAD. Mm-hmm. yeah. Then that would tell me that he probably started off wanting to be an artist, but um, obviously he has the chops to tell a good story. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I am very curious to see where this goes. And I think you said that, Issues five and six are probably on Kickstarter now. I think in December he started the Kickstarter. Yeah, for that, he so. he mentions that. Yeah, there's a Kickstarter going as of December thirteenth. Uh, I'm not sure it might be it might be finished by the time this goes up. But uh, yeah, that's yeah. for parts five and six, which will complete the story. Yeah, I, I'm really curious to to see how the story gets wrapped up Mm -hmm. what i will say when he pitched it to us he said an innocent fry cook makes one bad decision but the innocent fry cook doesn't seem innocent even from the beginning (laughs) like he's he's in a biker i don't know if he's in a biker gang but this kid that he's friends with is definitely bad news bears like you know he immediately when he, he gets stiffed on money he like resorts to violence starts hitting people with a pole like an iron pole um you know, decides to steal the money and drugs, you know, like, yeah, he's he, definitely he hides the drugs on this kid's motorcycle without even telling him about it. Yeah. Yeah. So this could, this, maybe this kid is kind of an innocent, you know, guy who got wrapped up in something bigger than what he thought it would be. But, um, I wouldn't say he's necessarily just a innocent fry cook. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, 
Yeah, yeah but I, mean, I see what the bad decision was that he uh, he confronted this biker gang, the leader of the biker yeah. gang. That was a huge mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, then that just gets tangled up with all these other aspects of the story. That's what keeps it interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, I. You know, it, it's interesting the timing on this because I just recently was trying to get back into some old PC games that I used to play back in the 90s. And I remember that I was really into a LucasArts game called Full Throttle. I don't mm. know if you've ever played that, but that's also like a biker uh, kind of point and click adventure. And so like seeing animated or, you know, like illustrated people in bike gangs and stuff made me think of Full Throttle, which is... Um, really, really great story as well, but I digress. So Mayfield Eight, do you understand what the title is referring to? Uh, I did at one point when I was reading it. I I know that it connected to something. Now I can't remember. Um, <laughs> well, maybe I don't. <laughs> maybe yeah, I because don't. I don't recall any references to anything called Mayfield or Eight of anything. Um, yeah, actually, not maybe it's that. one of those story titles that doesn't get explained until the end. Yeah, it could be. It very well could be. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny that that didn't even occur to me that I, like, it wasn't uh, something that I felt was missing. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I was just kind of going along for the ride. So, yeah, I like this kind of story where there's some little thing and it starts snowballing and snowballing. And, and I think the thing about this kid in this story is that he is quite willing to keep pushing it, you know? So he could leave well enough alone, but he keeps going further. Mm -hmm. Um, So it almost has like a breaking bad kind of thing where like he has a moment where he could kind of redeem himself or stop there and he keeps going for it, you know, Um, and digging Mm -hmm. in deeper. Cause it, it honestly starts off with something fairly innocent, right? Like he spray paints a guy's face and it starts getting worse and worse from there to the point where there's, you know, multiple bodies and, and he's a, you know, f- fugitive and all this other kind of stuff, but. Right. And he gets blamed for the explosion at the, cl- at the club that wasn't actually even his fault, but. Right. Right. Yeah. Because this biker leader hates him. He just, and he was in the vicinity. He gets blamed for that too. Yeah, very much so. Um, and then the, the only comment I have about the story, this is not necessarily a, criticism so much as just it kind of caught me off guard is that issue four is I would say mostly just sex scenes <laughs> I felt like it was like it was you know like they fit the story so it wasn't like super gratuitous or anything well I maybe the one with the well, uh it was issue three I think is the one with with a lot of sex in it okay okay yeah well oh, issue four I think has the sex scene between like the uh I, I don't know who he is, some some drug cartel. The guy, or, the guy with all the tattoos. Yeah. So that yeah, one didn't... That, that one is is issue four. Yeah. That one didn't really have any setup or it didn't really pertain to anything, but... Yeah, I mean, we, I, we haven't met these characters before. And <laughs> oh, you're right. having sex. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not to be prudish. I mean, like, it's it's fine. It's a, you know, it's part of the story. But the um, I am curious to see if this woman who saved him does come back because she seemed like it was kind of an important role, you know, her coming and saving him and stuff. And then they kind of go their separate ways. And he says, I love you to her on the phone, which is a bit weird. I wasn't sure if that was just because he's a a dumb kid and he, you know, (laughs) like fell in love with her by, you know, because they had sex or if uh, it's actually, there's something else there, but I I have a feeling she'll probably come back into the story. That's my my guess. Yeah, most likely. But um, yeah, she she needs to come back. I think. And I think also if this is if this is similar to like Sons of Anarchy kind of thing, there are always the biker mama kind of women who are important in the story. So yeah, I have a feeling that she probably will be coming back. Otherwise, that sex scene really was was not for any purpose. <laughs> right. Yeah. It needs to serve a purpose. And I, I think he's a good enough writer that he's not going to just throw it in so that we can see people having sex. I think there's a reason for it. Yeah. A story related reason. Unless it really is just like those old vertigo books. <laughs> they, they had a lot of that, but um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I would say that I, I would give this 
you know, I'm curious to see where this goes. And I, it actually made me curious to go and look on Kickstarter to see if it's still up or not. I haven't done that yet, but um, that's rare for me for the books that we review to actually take the effort to go and look them up and see if I can follow them. So I think that's a, the biggest testament I can say to the fact that I enjoyed this book. Okay. As we're recording this on January 9th, he has 69 backers. There are six days to go, and he's a little less than $400 short of his goal. But I think, you know, the last, and like beginning and end of a Kickstarter are when most of the money comes in, right? So, right, right, I think yeah. He's probably going to make it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to see that he's probably going to meet his goal because I, I would like to see where this goes. Yeah, I mean, presumably he got his goal for the first four issues, so you would think. I mean, you know, any comic, you know, the readership numbers tend to drop off little by little, but um, I think he can probably still get those same readers to come back for the last two. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm excited. I'll re- if if he if he wants us to review issues five and six, <laughs> go ahead sure. and send him over. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, listeners, if you'd like us to critique your comics, send a PDF or a link to mail at deconstructingcomics.com, and we'll read it and talk about it. So thanks for listening, and thank you, Adam. Thank you, Tim. Check out the link to the Mayfield 8 Kickstarter page in the show notes. Our theme is from bensound.com. You can help the Deconstructing Comics family of podcasts by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics and go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube to shop on Amazon to support the show and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. Next week should be a Deconstructing Comics episode in which Emmett and I discuss the two morrows so-called graphite edition of Jack Kirby's Captain Victory and the Galactic Rangers, a story originally published by Pacific Comics in the early 80s, and said to be a version of Kirby's intended ending for his fourth world saga at DC. Till next week, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Critiquing Comics. <laughs>